Welcome back to another weekly Ask GMBN Tech. Uh, this, of course, is the weekly show. You ask the questions, I give you the answers. Uh, anything matter by tech related goes, use the hashtag Ask GMBN Tech and get it in the comments underneath this very video. Uh, as you might have noticed, I'm back in my own bike cave this week. Uh, it's cold outside. Yes, we're in another lockdown. Uh, we can use our sets at work on a one in one out basis. It is very COVID secure, but uh, today, I thought I'd take the opportunity to film from home. Anyway, so first question coming up this week. This is in relation to my new proof reactor bike check that went out recently. So it's from uh, Tusson One. Geek question warning. Well, that's what we all are here, isn't it? Uh, how does the O Chain Spider interact with a hub with a higher number of engagement points? Uh, just before I read the rest of the question, in case you're wondering what he's talking about here, the O Chain device is this that you can see on screen, and it's the spider that this purple connection, uh, the purple chain is connected to on my Nukeproof reactor currently. I'm just experimenting with this product, and it essentially enables um, six, nine, or 12 degrees of movement of the crank and the chambering free movement before you essentially drive it forwards and the idea behind it is that on chains on, on suspension designs where the chain on the upper part actually grows or extends quite a bit you can isolate that feeling because you can feel that through the suspension and if you're able to disconnect that from the suspension then technically on paper the suspension will work a lot better so again I'm just experimenting with it on that bike but just going on to say People spend more money to use a heavier hub to have as little disconnects between the cranks and wheel movement. Now we're spending more money and adding more weight to add more disconnect between the cranks and the rear wheel. Why not save money and weight whilst adding reliability by going with a lower engagement rear hub to begin with? For example, DT Swiss website encourages gravity riders not to upgrade from the 18 point star ratchet because of the chain growth on suspension systems. Uh, thank you, long time subscriber, first time writer. Well, thank you for subscribing and thank you for commenting on here. So yeah, you've, you raise a very valid point. So bikes that have a lot of chain growth, in particular longer travel bikes, do suffer from this more than shorter travel bikes. Yeah, they can be susceptible to uh, hubs that pick up very quick. I've always been puzzled by people who are so insistent on having hubs that pick up exceptionally quick. Now, I know you're asking this question because I do have a hub on my new proof that does pick up very quick, but it was already on there. I didn't choose to spec this. This was part of the bike, and I just decided to try this O-Chain device out, which I'm trying on all three settings and on a number of different bikes. As well, some of my channel bikes and some older bikes that have got loads of chain growth. Uh, it's just a experimentation thing but yes you're absolutely right a hub with a far greater pickup or a bigger degree between those pickups will actually feel a lot better on bikes that do have a lot of chain tension now it's important to say that all suspension bikes will have some form of chain tension the only real exception being one that has a concentric pivot point basically so you, if your pivot goes around the bottom bracket that's really the only way to avoid any sort of upper chain growth as your chain as your suspension compresses that part of the chain will naturally become a bit tighter some bikes is very minimal like there's not a lot to be fair on my new proof um, but on some other bikes i'm not going to name yet until i've experimented with it i've got bikes that have got loads of chain growth so uh, could be kind of interesting on that because it will definitely improve the feeling of the suspension so again in case anyone's wondering Try a suspension bike, take the chain off it. Obviously be extremely careful because if you pedal with no chain, your body weight flies forward as you go over the bars. However, you'll probably notice the rear suspension feels incredible and almost a bit soft. Uh, it's kind of where we're trying to get to here by disconnecting things. So yes, you're absolutely right. You can achieve the same thing. However, many hubs that have a big degree between pickup points are actually cheaper hubs and they're not as reliable. So although you can get that effect on a cheaper hub, it's important to say the more expensive hubs that unfortunately typically come with a shorter or quicker engagement tend to be more reliable. So there's a kind of a fine tooth there. But DT is a great example because you can have them with different amounts all still using the ratchet drive system. So that's a win-win and that is a great tip. So uh, I might add something like that into the equation uh, amongst trying stuff out. Okay, next one is from Martin Price. Uh, what weight have you got the bike down to? I'm guessing around 27 pounds. Uh, unfortunately not, uh, it's not as light as 27 pounds, as much as I'd like it to be. Uh, bearing in mind that it's a size extra large, yeah, it's got 29 inch wheels on it. Yes, the wheels are light, but the tires aren't especially light, so I've got a trail casing, and they're big 2.4s as well. And although I didn't have an insert in the rear when I filmed the bike check, I have now, so it has gone up. It's hovering about 31 pounds at the moment, uh, that is with a full length dropper post on there, my Crank Brothers mallet e pedals on there, a mudguard on the front, bottle cage with the chain tool in there. 
Um, and I don't think that's a bad weight for a bike that would fit me, to be honest. I think that's pretty good. Uh, the New Proof Mega that I have on loan for the time being from Rob at New Proof, um, to be fair, I think that's only about 32 and a bit pounds. So it's only just heavier than it, which I, I think is outstanding for a bike that's that big. Uh, and I've actually got a Canyon Spectral here for a little while, and that one, bizarrely, that one's just over 30 pounds. That's lighter than Reactor, it's got more travel. Uh, so I need a bit of comparison here between them to figure out where that weight exactly is. But um, do you know what? Weight's not that important. As long as it's not abnormally heavy or abnormally light, as long as the bike rides well, that is the most important thing. And uh, well, yeah, it ride, rides brilliantly. Next question is from Keith Williams. Totally cool stuff, love all of it. It would be cool if you guys did an episode on photography stroke videography for mountain bikes. I noticed you mentioned Pocket Wizard. Uh, how exactly are you using a remote trigger on your bike? Okay, so, well, I'm actually using a Pocket Wizard right now. So the camera I'm filming with right today is my own Fujifilm xt3 and on above it i've got a little monitor so i can kind of see myself which i'm not looking at i'm looking at the lens at the moment but i can see it for monitoring for peaking and sound and things i've got a little manfrotto light on the side and i've got the pocket wizard connected to it and i've got the other pocket wizard in my hand which means i can go like this and turn you off and turn you back on again. Uh, it's super helpful because I can set my focal point and it means I don't have to get up and down constantly. And of course, filming from home, one of the downsides is a doorbell goes all the time if there's a delivery or for whatever reason. Now on my bike, I have a bit of a different setup. In fact, I'm gonna have to stop it and go and get it. Give me a second. Okay, so the Pocket Wizard setup returns. Okay, so on my camera, I have the Pocket Wizard and then underneath the camera, I have one of these, a little gorilla pod, well in fact a big gorilla pod. This is big enough to hold my camera to a tree. Yeah, this is really strong. I've used these loads of times. Brilliant piece of kit, there's loads of sizes. I think this is one of the bigger ones anyway. Um, I have that on there. And then on the other pocket wizard, I mount, or I take one of these off the bottom of my exposure light, and I mount it using the same bolt into the quarter inch thread that's in the bottom here, a little bit of thread lock on there. And this can mount on my handlebars. So I could just press the button to activate the camera, depending on what settings I want. But what I decided to do was get a little three and a half mil jack cable, jack to jack, cut the end off, and then soldered on a push to close button. And you get push to open, this one's a push to close, there's literally one push is one, one picture. If you put it on servo, if you've got a Canon or a motor drive or whatever camera it is, you can just hold it down, it'll take a series of photos, basically. Uh, I run that on the handlebars, plugged it into the actual pocket wizard. Uh, in fact, just like this on screen. And I'm just gonna throw on screen a few example images I've taken with this exact setup. Uh, here's a really old one from the GMBN days on my old um, original Nukeproof Mega, I think. Uh, this one's taken in Spain on a trip I went to with Blake. Uh, this one's taken at Kum Khan, one of my favorite trail centers to ride. Uh, and just a couple more, including a big puddle splash. Uh, yeah, all using this setup, super cool. Um, if you wanna know more, actually drop us a line and maybe I'll do another video on making this sort of thing. Uh, if anyone's actually genuinely interesting because I did make one a while back a few years probably about three or four years ago on GMBN wasn't that popular but maybe there's a different audience here so uh, let us know okay next one is from Nico L does anyone know where they get the clear piece of perspex to stand up the bike uh, yeah I do because it's mine it's a 22 millimeter diameter piece of acrylic rod uh, get them on eBay Amazon anywhere like that uh, I can't remember what length I got but I chopped mine down um, I can measure it so you can this one now is 44 centimeters or 440 millimeters, and that works perfectly for a variety of bikes. Um, I like to use the BB axle, basically straight in that empty hollow bolt there, jams it in there nicely, or sometimes you can wedge it by the rear disc rotor. I've cut an angle on one end here and just cut some grooves into it and got a little bit of mastic tape on each end for a bit of traction. Wicked bit of kit, and it's really easy to clone out in the photos as well. As you probably noticed, I post a lot of pictures of bikes, and that's the only bit of Photoshop I do, is just to clone that out. Super easy with this because it's clear, it transmits the same color as the background, so uh, you're not messing with too much stuff. It's literally and it's gone. Perfect. Okay, next question is from the bike room. Ah, okay, speaking of uh, Kumkan, I did a ride yesterday at Kumkan Twerk Trail. This bike would be ideally suited, again, I think talking about my reactor, and yeah, it does, it flies around that trail. Uh, I couldn't believe how many bikes that overtook me and my son were all e-bikes. Um, the amount of EMFs on that mountain side, it lit like a Christmas tree. Seemed to me a lot of riders are fed up and no uplifts, and new bike purchases around the five grand mark are e-bikes to beat the lockdown bans on uplifts. 
what are your thoughts? Uh, yeah, it's kind of interesting. Definitely the self-uplifting is uh, attractive. It's something that early adopters of the e-bike could see as a benefit straight out, but of course there are a lot of people digging in heels with e-bikes and not wanting to have anything to do with it. Oh, that's cheating, this and that. It's like, it's not, get over it. It's just a different form of mountain biking. If you like a shuttle-based riding, then an e-bike could actually be your best friend. Uh, it's not that interesting to me, but I 100% get why people would want to do it. Think about it, you're riding a bike with loads of travel, you've got a heavy battery and motor on the frame, so having all that weight on the main frame effectively means your unsprung mass is a lot lighter. The suspension works incredibly on e-bikes compared to a bike of the same travel, the same suspension system with no motor and battery. You wouldn't believe how well they cover ground and it's actually why now a lot of the downhill riders are favouring e-bikes as their winter bikes so they can go out and just smash runs all day long and actually get more fitness because they're not really pushing the bike up, they're still riding the bike up and whatever you say, if you go out on an e-bike and you go hard, you can come back even more smashed than you can on a normal bike. They're bigger, they're heavier, they can be harder to manoeuvre and they're so much fun. So they're definitely here to stay for that sort of rider. Um, also, I think there's probably two other types of rider you'll see. Perhaps someone that used to ride a long time ago and they might have had kids or you know a bit of a break from riding and they've used the e-bike as like, their excuse to get back into riding or to validate getting back into riding. Oh, it's a bit easier, a bit more fun. And yeah, 100% is. So no doubt some of those riders will have been people that used to ride come car in their fitter days and now they're back with a vengeance. And of course, the other type of rider is a brand new mountain biker. So anyone coming into the sport, massive welcome. If you're looking at this show for the first time, uh, check out all our other channels, especially EMBN if you're riding an uh, electric mountain bike. I think it's amazing the sheer amount of people that are coming in to mountain biking via electric bikes but it is making a brand new type of mountain biker. And some you know, some people could argue that there's issues with trail etiquette and stuff that people just don't know because they're able to go and get to places where you'd actually have to be pretty fit and pretty burly to get to previously. Now, a good example of that is the Kumkan Twerk Trail that you were talking about. Now, anyone that knows it knows how difficult or how challenging that first climb is. And actually, it's probably my favorite place locally-ish to go riding. I love how hard that climb is. It really does clear out the lungs on the way out. But I have taken people there before that are fairly new to biking and it shocked them to the point they've not gone back and they've only got the Forest of Dean for a nice easy climb up to the top. Uh, it really is a difficult one. If you've not ridden Kumkan's Twerk Trail, it's one of the original mountain bike trails in Wales. Uh, I think it's probably the first official one in South Wales. I might be wrong there, but of course, um, Coyde Brennan was first up top. That was what started the whole model. Uh, and then the Twerk Trail was built by Russ Burton and a team of amazing builders. And really, it's only been um, topped up over the years. It's still fairly true to what it was to start with. Uh, stood the test of time. One of the most physical climbs, followed by a flat out descent. What's not to like about that? Okay. Next one is in relation to the manufacturing about bikes and brands. Uh, I forget what show that came from, but nonetheless, from Ruby Bite. Doddy, you missed something there. Most of the frame manufacturers don't make their own frames. They may design them, but it's usually giant or some traditional Taiwanese factories that manufacture strokes builds bikes for everyone else. Uh, so it might be like 800 bike frames on this, but all funnels into one or two actual manufacturers. Yeah, you're 100% right. As, um, well, actually, you're very close to being right. And uh, there's more than just one or two manufacturers, but you're completely right. There's a few manufacturers in the Far East and Taiwan, and Indonesia and so forth that make for a huge amount of brands. Uh, Giant, of course, biggest bike brand on earth, they are one of them and they manufacture for loads of bike brands. Uh, Merida is another brand out there as well as making their own bikes. They make for loads of other companies as well. Uh, it's, it's quite astonishing the amount of stuff out there. Now, it's not really something I've seen firsthand and I would love to. Now, I was supposed to go to Taipei last year. Please, I hope that it is okay and things clear up so I can go this year because I really want to go to factory and see how it works. I'll sign any non-disclosure, no problem at all. I want to go in there and just see stuff. Now, the closest I've come was uh, the Lion Tires Factory in Thailand when I went over there to make that uh, video for Victoria. Now, that was amazing because being a manufacturer, they actually make for loads of other brands. So I saw loads of different branded tires. Uh, again, I signed an NDA, so I can't tell you anything that I saw, but uh, I saw stuff in there that was made that's only just come to market now. So I felt very privileged, but um, sworn to secrecy on that one. Now, I was also supposed, also supposed to be seeing Polygon bikes, which are based in Indonesia. And I was supposed to go and see them at their factory. Now, Polygon were actually gonna close down production to time it for our arrival, so we could see from beginning to end an entire production and a series of bikes being made. And just, the, you know, the, the thought of seeing that from beginning to end is something that I absolutely have to see. So please let this happen this year. It'd be mega cool. And uh, of, of course, we'll make a really cool video all about it.
Okay, so um, next up is from Beyond Our Arena. Previously, Mavic, Regida, and another French rim brand did a tubeless system with a flap. Uh, it worked well, and sometimes Michelin tires, Comp 24 and Comp 16 was already tubeless and ready to work with them. Yeah, I do remember those for the flap. Uh, and years before the UST tubeless. And actually, uh, Martin Walker said, Nagesti, or Nagesti, rings a bell. Yeah, I totally remember seeing that logo alongside UST. And for what I remember, they didn't do anything to do a rim design as such. It was more the interface with the tire. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but from what I can remember, the tires had a bead and had like a, imagine that's your, the rim with the hook and the bead would go under it like this. It had like a little rubber flap that would sit over the top like that. Uh, I'm pretty sure from memory that's how it worked, but it all relied on the tire, the way it would sit on the rim. As far as I know, the rims were still fairly standard on the inside. They might have had a, an accentuated bead to really grip that tire, but I'm pretty sure that they you still had to seal up the rim bed on them. Uh, and that is where the difference came with UST, because UST was a sealed rim bed, and then the spokes and, uh, spokes and nipples would screw into the rim, but not penetrate the inner part of the rim. Uh, that was the real key to the success of that system. Either way, amazing and French related. Uh, the French knew what they were doing. They really did experiment with that stuff back in the day. And of course, there's the Michelin system that a lot of racers famously use. It's essentially like a moose that uh, motocross riders tend to use. But brilliant stuff. Tubeless is amazing. If you've not used Tubeless, uh, try it out. There's going to be some videos underneath you, underneath this video for you to check out, learn a bit more about setting up. It's nothing to be afraid of. Honestly, if you get a good tire and you get your good sealant and stuff, it's pretty easy to get set up and get rolling. Taking weight out, fixing punctures on the go. Really, what's not to like, and I've said that twice, and you're probably gonna pick up on that, like with all my little weird sayings. Uh, next up is from Max Cheshire. Dolly, I'm just wondering, I'm looking at buying a new full suspension bike, but I'm a bit lost. I wanna buy an orange, but I've seen they're a single pivot bike, and I've noticed the bikes that you like at GMBN ride, and looking at other bikes, they tend to have a double pivot. Is there a huge difference, or is it all preference? Um, okay, well, there's loads of different suspension bikes on the market, I mean, absolutely loads. So the two major designs, without going down that whole route of suspension designs, you get single pivots and you get linkage bikes. Now, the fundamental difference between them is, on a single pivot bike, you don't have any pivots between your rear wheel axle and that main pivot that's by the bottom bracket somewhere. It could be higher or it could be low. On a linkage style bike, you get an, another pivot in the middle there between the two, which makes it a linkage or a four bar style linkage. Now, the reason you would have one over the other, um, the thing that people love about single pivots is it's a fairly constant leverage ratio that offers towards a shock. So suspension tuners and maybe long travel bikes that you know want to be designed to be big hitting, they really love the way of working with them because of the way they can tune the shock to work with the system. However, you get a slight disadvantage in the fact they don't pedal quite as well. So you do get linkage versions and various different orientations of them. But single pivots are brilliant. I've ridden loads over the years. And then linkage style bikes, you get a bit more control of maybe pedaling forces and braking forces and stuff. But there's always a downside. Whilst you might make a bike feel brilliant and isolated to those things, you're obviously gonna have another effect somewhere else down the line. Uh, so there isn't any one that design is better than others, but the four bar is definitely um, quite common. So I've got my Canyon Lux, that's four bar, my Nucleus Reactor, that's four bar, and I've got another Canyon that's also four bar. So uh, pretty weird, all four bars. I need to get a single pivot back in my life. Uh, I've always loved single pivot bikes, and orange make excellent bikes. So don't be put off by that. If that takes your fancy, get one, you will love it. Just get it set up right. That is the most important thing. Uh, enjoy it. Now, I think that's it for this week. Yeah, so a good amount of questions there. So that's the end of this week's show. Uh, thanks for watching. Uh, keep the questions coming in. I love answering them. Uh, and I love how picky some people are and I love how open and generic other questions are. Uh, variety is always good. As always, if you've got any personal questions for me, feel free to fire them through about any of the bikes I have, any stuff I've ridden in the past. Just use that hashtag, Tech, and we'll see you in the next video. Ta-ra!